Gracious Heavenly Father, seal to our heart that which you would have us know, that we may grow in grace and knowledge of you. We so long for your return. We know that you are faithful and that you always direct us and guide us by your love. We love you, Lord. We just ask that you would filter out all of that which is ignorant and foolish and that which is of the flesh, but just seal to our hearts that which is truth. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We thank you for your word and we thank you for the time that you've given us to come together and just study it together. Open our eyes, our minds, our hearts to understand your will for us during this present time. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. This is Wednesday. We uh, are studying through the book of Acts. We just began that on Sunday, and I s sort of uh, introduced uh, into the, uh, the, the playlist, uh, started a new playlist in Acts. I uh, gave what I thought was... Uh, a fairly uh, proper introduction to the book of Acts. So that's what we're doing on Sunday. This is Wednesday. And I want to talk about something uh, that I can't help but bring Acts into it. Uh, so we uh, may be sort of uh, uh, accomplishing two purposes at once here. We, we have a look at the church's uh, uh, beginning there in the book of Acts. I, I pointed out that or as I suggested that in reading through Acts, uh, we would not have done it as things as poorly as Christ appeared to do it. Uh, tremendous contrast between what really took place then and, and what we see today. Uh, you know, choosing a ragtag tag group of uh, 12, uh, one of whom wound up betraying uh, our Lord, and then leaving them alone and expecting something to come of it. You know, I, I pointed out the fact that he left them with the Holy Spirit. So what would appear from the human standpoint to be uh, utter defeat is in fact the body of Christ built upon the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And here the Holy Spirit is showing us its beginning and from every possible concept from the human mind, you know, its beginning is terrible. You know, not from God's standpoint, but from the human standpoint. God isn't going to do it the way we, we do it. And I suggested to you that in Acts, we're looking at the uh, New Testament wilderness journey, uh, just as there was in the Old Testament. You know, they, God delivered His people out of the land of Egypt he delivered them from bondage. He took them out into the wilderness for 40 years. Uh, he took care of them. He fed them. He clothed them. Their clothes didn't wear out. Uh, it was a, a period of hardship. Uh, the whole purpose was to trust God. And, and so we're looking at somewhat of a, a beginning of the, the New Testament wilderness journey as we enter into Acts. Now, uh, Many of you are focused on the end times. Uh, I know uh, I, I am. Uh, we have been for the past six years since this ministry began. And so uh, I hope to uh, shed some light on, on this whole idea of watching and waiting and anticipating uh, with eagerness our Lord's return uh, by talking just a little bit about what we talked about in Acts and, and going on a few further in the verses uh, uh, I, in the uh, beginning introduction, I dealt with uh, the first three verses. Uh, verse 1, the, the former treatise have I made, O Theophilus. This is Luke talking by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Of course, God is the author, as I so adamantly point out in all of our studies. Uh, God is the author, but Luke is the human author. He's writing... Uh, to Theophilus, uh, I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, it's uh, he, he mentions right at the very beginning, the former treatise have I made. I believe Luke is speaking of the book of Luke. Uh, 
as he uh, writes to Theophilus. Now, Theophilus, the name, the very name means friend of God. It's a compound name, a compound word. It's where we get our word God, Theos, and uh, 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 Philos, Philos, or Philos, uh, friend. Uh, the name means friend of God. Of course, we know from Scripture Moses was a friend of God. Moses is mentioned as a friend of God. Abraham is mentioned as a friend of God. And you and I are mentioned as friends of God in the New Testament. And he says, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up, after that he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. Uh, we could stop there and probably spend a month or more you know, on the, on the, on the fact that he chose them. Uh, that they did not choose him. I think that makes a huge difference in the way that we approach the scriptures and, the, and, and in the building and the formation of our own personal Christian worldview and our own Christian you know, theology, our theological position. He chose them. Uh, to whom he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things uh, what things pertaining to the kingdom of God? He didn't speak of them, uh, of things pertaining to his return. Well, he had already done that in Matthew chapter 24. Uh, or we read about that in Matthew 24. Uh, things pertaining to the end of the age. I want to I ask you folks... Uh, to, uh, to please consider a few things in this video. I'm, uh, my thoughts are pretty scattered on all of this. I'm trying to combine, you know, two things here. You know, our study through Acts and, and what I see is, a, is an appropriate video for Wednesday concerning, uh, you know, prophecy, the prophetic timeline and stuff like that. So I want to bring to your attention one important pact a fact right from the outset of this. Uh, I want you to take note of the fact that God's direction given them by commandments, uh, we read there in verse 2 that through the Holy Spirit, He had through the Holy Spirit given commandments unto the apostles. He had given instructions to the apostles. So right away we see God's direction given them by commandments and that these directions were very specific. That's what I want you to take note of. Very specific. So right away we see where our Lord would have His disciples' attention focused, which is on the present, not the future. Now that sure sounds like a good argument against what we're doing here, you know, in focusing so much on the future. But I'm going to try to explain to you why I do, I do not believe that that's the case. I want you to take note here of the personal pronouns. Uh, when I was back in Bible college, it was a big thing that was drilled, kind of pounded into you that it was important to take note of personal pronouns. Well, if, it doesn't take a whole lot of thought to think of just how true that is. You know, uh, I can write a letter to someone, uh, just a regular letter, and I can address it to someone, and I can lose that letter on my way to the post office and someone else find it and read it, and, uh, uh, and it not pertain to them, though they may pick it up and read it and think that it does. Uh, what distinguishes that, what sets that apart from you know, the, 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 the truth of the matter is, is, that, is the, the use, my use of personal pronouns. It is important to take... Uh, into consideration whom the Holy Spirit is speaking to, uh, uh, who is this, pa this verse, this passage, who is God speaking to, as well as when He's speaking it. It's also another important factor, the, the time element in this. These are things that, that, that most Bible teachers are, are just trained to do is to is take a look at uh, the, 
the important aspects of context and, and so on and so forth. Uh, so beginning at verse 4 in Acts, uh, we read, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem. So uh, I'm, I'm looking at three personal pronouns. It's not, it's not me. I was not, uh, I didn't assemble together with them. Uh, or uh, I, I didn't assemble together. I did not assemble together with these disciples. Uh, I was not commanded by God that I should not depart from Jerusalem. In fact, I've never been to Jerusalem uh, before in my life. And so, I guess I'm, maybe I'm trying to push the point too far. Uh, I don't think I need to. I think it's clear that personal pronouns are important. It, I can give you an example uh, with the book of Hebrews. You know, we Christians automatically just, you know, they'll pick up the, big, the Bible, they'll, they'll open it up to the book of Hebrews, and they'll, they'll read... Uh, uh, you know, there are a few passages in Hebrews that would scare the pants off of many uneducated believers. Uh, but, and they'll make some try to make some direct application to themselves. Uh, the fact of the matter is that the epistle was written to the Hebrews. We are not Hebrews. Now, if you are a presently a Jew living in Israel, you are a Hebrew, and you, you somehow come to to uh, to read that New Testament book of the Hebrews, uh, which you're likely probably not to do, but if you know the, the uh, Orthodox Judaism doesn't typically recognize the New Testament as being the Word of God, but if you were to pick up that book to the of the Hebrews, it would be speaking of you. Of course. Uh, I don't think it would be speaking of anyone in my community. I don't know if there's any that there's any Jews at all living in little tiny Monroe, Oklahoma. We're off out in the middle, of, off out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, so uh, I, I think that uh, at least you know I, I think I've made my point there. We are uh, to note personal pronouns, who it is being addressed. Uh, he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, and I consider that very, very important. Uh, there is no direct application to you and I today to not depart from Jerusalem. I mean, that's it's pretty plain. I mean, pretty simple point, okay? And I, but, but it's an extremely important point that I want you to get there. Uh, we are not waiting on the promise of the Holy Spirit. He says, he goes on to say, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, you have heard of me. Well, we are not waiting on the promise of the Holy Spirit, dearly beloved. We've already received the Holy Spirit. So obviously, we, there's no direct application of that verse to you and me, or you and I. Uh, however, uh, 66 years I've been alive, and I'm, I still don't know the do whether, which is proper, you and me or you and I. So forgive me for that ignorance, but we are, not all, we are not presently waiting to receive the Holy Spirit. That's obviously true. I don't think any Christian would argue that today. Uh, verse uh, 5, For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now, not many days hence says your authorized version. Not many days from now, you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is clearly pointing, painting a picture here, showing us a clear picture of a very specific people at a very specific time in which uh, their condition, their state, uh, was clearly revealed. They had not received the Holy Spirit. They were to wait for the promise of the Father uh, until they were baptized with water or with the Holy Spirit. They, John had baptized with water. They were to be baptized with the Holy Spirit 
not many days from now. Now, there's, I could I could take a long rabbit trail here, and I could really kind of jump on this big, long uh, winded uh, bandwagon about you know how well we can't do anything apart from the Holy Spirit. That that uh, our uh, being baptized into the body of Christ makes a tremendous difference on on uh, on how on how we are to operate. I mean, we can't op we couldn't operate apart from the Holy Spirit. Is my point. So I mean, but that's a that's a sermon for another day. But they were to uh, uh, be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from then. I'm going to suggest their focus was to be on the present, not the future. Now, don't get confused here because uh, it sure seems like an argument against what we're doing by looking at uh, possible timelines, by looking at uh, the events that occur around us and, and trying to uh, guess when, when the uh, most likely possible time that uh, would be that that our Lord would return, you know, just doing what watchmen do seems to be an argument against that. Uh, because their focus was to be on the present, not the future. They, they asked him, when are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Uh, he said, it was not for you to know. We're going we're gonna to look at this. And this is where much of the confusion, I think, comes in. Verse uh, 6, when they therefore would come together, they asked him, again, uh, our personal pronouns are important, they asked him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? I mean, this was where their focus was at. For, this is what their focus was on. It was, on, it was not on what we see, that New Testament wilderness that we see in the book of Acts and life and service and ministry and martyrdom. That was not their focus. Their focus was on the end of everything. Uh, I would like to think that we here at Blessed Hope Forever are somehow striking a balance between what how we operate and function in, at this present time and yet uh, there is some anticipation about an eager anticipation about what we're about to experience in the near future. And I say near future because I believe that we have enough evidence to indicate that we are nearing the closing of the age. But when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? Uh, seems like an argument against what we're doing, but Again, we are looking at the beginning of the church here in Acts. We're looking at the beginning, not the end of the age. And we are not the disciples. Is it, is it odd that he would give them instructions different than the instructions that he would give us? Well, of course not. There's also the matter of the the difference, there is a difference between, this is where it's important to look at words and define terms. Uh, I'm, I'm that's kind of big on that. Uh, if we don't understand the meaning of words, we're pretty lost. It's important that we define terms. We look at words and, and uh, oftentimes these words don't reveal their true meaning in the authorized text. We have to go back to the original text to see uh, for example, uh, the word know, is that a perfect knowledge, oida in the Greek, or is that an experiential knowledge, gnosko, uh, does make a difference in the verse. So there is a difference between perfect and experiential knowledge. And he said in the Greek, he said, then unto them. Now your authorized version is not going to have the word then there, but the Greek does. He, he said, then unto them, it is not for you. Okay, not yours it is in the Greek. Again, the Greek just is so colorful. It really does really, to me, dispel the fog here. Uh, the text literally says in the Greek, he said, then unto them, it is not 
yours it yours it it is not it is not uh, not yours it is. That's how it's expressed in the Greek. Not yours it is. To know, and the word know is, is the word gnosko, experiential knowledge. It is not to you, for you to have an experiential knowledge of the times and seasons, or seasons. Uh, the word the in the text is not there. That's also very important. Sometimes... Uh, I've noticed that in the authorized version, uh, they'll they'll have the word the there, like the faith, and then you go and look in the Greek, and the word the's not there, uh, or vice versa. Uh, the word the is not there. It, it's literally uh, not yours. It is to experientially know times, not the times, but times or seasons and both of those times and seasons are plural plural which the father hath put now the greek says put in place in his own authority says the greek okay this is what the text says verse 8 but ye shall in the future that's a future tense you, shall, you, ye, ye all, it's ye all plural, okay? He's talking to them. We, we haven't abandoned the important rule of noting personal pronouns here. Ye shall in the future receive power. Uh, after that, the Holy Spirit, well, now hold on. After that is not there in the original text. It's, it's, um, I mean, it may be italicized in your authorized version. It's not after that. It's, it just simply reads, uh, will receive power, the Holy Spirit, that's pneumatos, Spirit, Holy Spirit, having come upon you, aorist active participle, already happened. It's already come upon you. Now, don't be confused about that. They weren't baptized into the body of Christ until the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost. But what the text is telling us is, and you and I, is that it's, it had come upon you. The Holy Spirit has come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Two things I want to point out. The word witness. It may come as a shock to you. I'm sure it, it probably will. Uh, but I have to be honest with the text, folks. We are not called witnesses. We are not called witnesses. I can, I can hear people clicking off the video right now. Dearly beloved, we are called ambassadors for Christ. Now, if you want to argue with me that, that well, what's the difference, Steve? You know, what's the difference between a witness and an ambassador? I would argue that, that well, what's, what, why would God use two different words? He didn't say that we were witnesses of Christ. He said that we are ambassadors for Christ. Here, he's saying that they shall be witnesses unto me, both, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And I am going to suggest to you folks, this gospel was, did go out to all the earth all the earth, the uttermost parts of the earth at that time. In fact, I'm going to suggest that there were many there present, probably at least 120 apostles in the upper room that, who were baptized into the Holy Spirit and were that they were speaking in tongues and the language, a known language. This, this was not just gibberish. This was their known language. It was a sign tongue to those nations, to those peoples, and, uh, you know, if you want to get into prayer tongues and stuff, then that's another whole, another subject. And, and, uh, and, and I don't even want to touch that on that right now. 
Um, I believe all the signed gifts have, have been uh, uh, were fulfilled. They serve their purpose. Uh, whether there's knowledge, it'll pass away, and so on and so forth. We have the complete Word of God. There's no further need for that. But what I'm trying to suggest to you here is, is that by God's own statement, He says that in verse 8, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, God says to you and I that this went out to the uttermost parts of the earth. I'm going to suggest that there were those there on Pentecost from other nations, every single nation on earth, and that they heard the gospel in their own native tongue. Of course, today, you know, we have Christians walking around believing that there's some place, a uh, dark place uh, over in Africa somewhere. Somewhere there's some, some place where they've never heard the gospel. I do not think that argument can hold an ounce of water. I believe it's done. Verse 9, And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up. Now that is a passive voice. This is just throwing this out here for your interest, for your, you know. Uh, it is a passive voice. Passive voice indicates that Christ didn't take himself up. Uh, he was taken up by some external agent, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suggest that that's, that agent was God, the Father, and a cloud, and that is singular in the Greek, a single cloud and the text says, hid him out of their sight. Uh, the Greek literally states, hid, hid him from their eyes. That's what the text says. I, uh, I kind of came to grips with the whole reality years and years ago that revelation is, is timely. It's based upon personal need. We don't all have the same degree of faith. We weren't all enlightened and invested with faith to trust God in all the same areas of our lives. We are unique in that sense. Uh, there's a person, a very real, uh, I guess what you'd call a personal uh, uh, intimate, personal relationship, you know, uh, factor involved in all of it. Uh, he's working in your life uh, different than he is in mine and vice versa. Uh, we can't expect a young believer in the Lord to understand as much as a uh, someone who's been in the ministry and preached behind a pulpit for 50 years. I mean, that's obvious. You wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. You shouldn't do that. Of course you wouldn't do that. No, not if you had any real sense about yourself. You wouldn't do that. You wouldn't compare them like that. You wouldn't, you wouldn't say to the, the Christian that was just born again yesterday, man, you ought to know as much as the guy who's been preaching for 50 years. You wouldn't do that. Uh, revelation is timely. It's based upon personal need. And not just your need, but God's needs and what He has planned. Uh, in John 16, 12, we read, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Well, that's, that's interesting. Now, you know, folks, it would be awfully strange if we were all on the same level when it came to revealed knowledge and the investment of faith. Would it not? So I believe that revelation is timely. It's based upon personal need, and that's what we're looking at here uh, in the context of Acts chapter 1. Now, now we get to verse 7, I believe. Uh, no, I, I'm going to back up to verse 7. Uh, it is not for you, not yours it is, to, to know in an experiential way uh, times or seasons. The word times there is uh, our word chronos, which where we get our word chron chronological. It's the, the, the chronological time. Or the seasons, that's, that's kairos. Now the word is kairos. Both of these words are plural, but kairos denotes a very specific appointed time. 
And uh, that's what I want to deal with primarily in this video. Uh, I've, as you can see, I've kind of brought our Sunday Acts into this. But uh, Acts, verse, uh, Acts chapter 1 verse 7 gives us a verse that appears on the surface to for, forbid us from even thinking about what's going to happen in the future. And I don't think that that's the case at all. This is why I point out the importance of personal pronouns and, and so on and so forth. So, uh, I'll read you what Ellicott's commentary uh, said. He's, uh, they are left to the teaching of the Spirit and of time to remold and purify their expectations of the restoration of Israel. What was needed now was the patience that waits for and accepts that teaching. This is what Ellicott said, and so once again, I'm going to suggest that Revelation is timely. It's based upon personal need. There's another commentator, his name's McLaren. Uh, in his expositions, he writes, What may come is all hidden. Uh, we can make vague guesses, but reach nothing more certain, and I could not agree more. I think if you're so foolish as to uh, go beyond guessing or go, go beyond uh, just mere looking at the season and trying to... It, it's interesting how that the, uh, the times and seasons, the word seasons there is the, uh, an appointed time. Well, can we know the appointed time of our Lord's return? Can we know that? Should we know that? Uh, are we doing wrong by trying to know that? These are important questions. Uh, he says we can reach nothing more certain. All we can do is make guesses. Well, of course, uh, that's true. I, I, would, I would be foolish not to agree with that statement. Dearly beloved, there is not a single person, on, I'm gonna, here's what I'm going to say, there's not a single person alive on earth today that knows the day of the Lord's return. Never, and never will there ever be. I, no, it doesn't matter how much how many timelines we make, doesn't matter how many, how much facts we gather together. I, I've, I've often kind of boasted in the, the amount of data that I've accumulated in the past six years you know, on, on all of this uh, end time stuff. When it comes down to it, folks, we know if we have any sense about ourselves at all, we know that we not only do we not know, will not know the day nor the hour, no one else will. No one else will. So that is not the top, that's not the subject. That's not, that's not the question here. The, the only real question that, that I want to address is should we even be looking at it at all? Okay, well, okay, since we can't know the day or the hour, should we be even trying to, to understand the season that we're in? The, gener the generation that we're in, the age that we're in, takes a lot to make an assertion such as, you know, well, we're living at the end of the age. You know, well, how do we know that? I think there's a lot of factors that will, will prove that we are. Now, never mind the fact that we have numerous examples of those who knew what God was going to do beforehand. You know, Noah knew, Elijah knew, Enoch knew. And dearly beloved, at the midpoint of the tribulation, the admonition to believing Jews is to flee to the mountains. And the Word of God gives us all the exact number of days that the Antichrist reigns before Christ returns. That's 1260 days. We have that information. God gave us that as well as the number of days that the two witnesses preach the gospel of the kingdom in the first half of the tribulation. That's 1,260 days. Now, this is information God's given us. Did, he, did the disciples have that information? Could they have accessed that information? Now, 
in talking about a revelation not yet even re revealed, the issue as it, as I see it at least, the issue as it concerns us today is not about a desire uh, uh, for, we have this desire for a forbidden knowledge. Okay, that's just, you know. Of course, folks, no one can know the day. Of course they can't. If you said to me, well, Steve, the rapture's going to occur at 12.05 a.m. Saturday, July the 10th while we're asleep, I'm going to think you're nuts. Whereas if you told me, well, Steve, uh, I think Christ could return on Pentecost or, or on a Feast of Trumpets next year, given everything that's going on, I think that's possible. Given the season that we're in, I would not think you're nuts. And I would not criticize you. And dearly beloved, I cannot honestly, for the life of me, foresee you getting in trouble for saying that to me at the judgment seat of Christ. I mean, let's, let's look at, I mean, look. I think God gave us a brain. I, I, to think about these things rationally. And soberly. Do you honestly think that the Lord is going to condemn people for being so anxious and so eager for His return that, and I'm not talking about being dogmatic, but suggesting that we're at the near, near the end of the age? Really? I don't think that it's, it's about a desire of, of, of forbidden knowledge at all. It's, uh, and that's what the, but that's what many try to, to, to impress upon you. Well, no man can know the day or the hour. Folks, huge difference between day and hour and times and seasons. Of course, there's always the two-day factor. We've talked about this before. I mean, dearly beloved, when the rapture does occur, our today will be another person's yesterday or tomorrow, okay? Because we live on a round planet, okay? A round earth that rotates, okay? On its axis. So we're looking at a two-day thing. So how are you going to know the day or the hour? Well, you can't. Just for that fact alone, you'll never know the day or the hour. Well, your day of rapture may be another person's yesterday or tomorrow. And, and I just think we need to, to think rationally and soberly about these things. Never mind the fact that if you just go back one verse there, you know, it's, uh, it's speaking of the creation of the new heavens and the new earth. Of course, you could argue, well, that's, you know... It, that applies to anything at the end of the age. Can't know the day, nor the hour. The context, dearly beloved, is the beginning of the church, okay? And the disciples' mission for those days, not the end of the church's days on earth. I can't stress that enough. And the disciples would all die before the turn of the century. Well, no wonder that he told them that he used the word experiential knowledge. It's not given to you to know by, by experience. Okay. None would be alive much past the first century. You know, temple destroyed 70 AD, you go into to the Revel book of Revelation written in the 90s. I mean, they're just not there, they're not alive. Uh Of course, it wasn't for them to experientially know times or seasons. Jesus knew that every one of these disciples would die before the turn of the century. But we, however, stand here 2,000 years later. Big, big, huge difference. Okay? We are not in darkness that that day should overtake us as a thief. That's 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. That day will not overtake us as a thief. Uh, we've talked about that. There's the age in which we're living. 
So I'm going to I'm going to crawl out on what I believe is a, a very strong limb here and suggest that at least half the planet knows we are in the season of our Lord's return. And I cannot see for the life of me how that my saying that would cause his people to do anything but direct their eyes heavenward. But the arguments often made that such a suggestion is foolish, that it's unneedful, that it's even harmful, or that somehow such enthusiasm and zealousness offends God. Really? Seriously? You don't really believe that, do you? It makes zero sense that the final generation should all be blinded and, 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 and or indifferent to his near return or be fearful of treading on so-called sacred ground, sacred unknown territory. Folks, the only ground that's sacred that we shouldn't tread on is being dogmatic about a specific date on the calendar. Most watchmen don't do that. That is just plain foolish. As it, it, that's about as foolish as it gets, okay? Kind of irritates me every time I see someone in a video try to do that. We have never done that, despite what you may think. We're trying to get the overall feeling of the times that we're in through these timelines. So the foolishness of suggesting that a final watchful generation is somehow intruding upon forbidden sacred territory by trying to discern the times and the seasons is just, sorry, it's just, well, God knew that I would be declaring His near return in the year 2023 and 2022, and 2021, and 2020, and 2019, and 2018, and 2017, and 2016. God knew that. I don't think that disturbs Him one iota. And, and it doesn't hinder my fellowship and communion with Christ one tiny bit. You know, I can say with certainty that has not been uh, my experience as it pertains to my relationship with God's people either. Of course, he could come at any time, but just, but any time. The Lord could come back any time. But to stand so hard on that fact, and, and it is a fact, that, that we hide the fact from his people that the overall evidence points to his near return at this present time in history is worse than foolish, folks. I think that can be more harmful. It, it kind of lends to our saying, well, where is the promise of his coming? And I also have serious doubts that our blessed Lord will somehow, someday, give us some spanking for trying to discern the times. I believe that we operate in the safe zone by simply discerning the times based on the information that's freely given us. Okay? Freely given us. For example, and I'm going to throw a few things out here. The 80 years since Israel, 1948, can be pushed no further past December 1st, 2024, at the latest without violating the doctrine of a pre-trib rapture where that this date would be the midpoint. In simple terms, a midpoint, December 1, 2024, plus 1260 days to the second advent on Israel's 80th birthday, May 14, 2028. I suggest that you write that down and give it due consideration. Additionally, on this midpoint date, December 1 in the year 1939, the Polish Jews were forced to wear the Star of David armbands. Now, is it wrong for me to tell you that? I don't think so. We are also less than a month away from the date God drowned the world in a cataclysmic flood. That's December 2nd on our calendar this year. Huge difference between day and the hour and times and seasons. And only in the last 75 years has the church in Israel existed at the same time. That's got to mean something. And it seems to me that this historic rise, unprecedented global rise in anti-Semitic protests worldwide could be, very well be, the catalyst that triggers the rapture. Is that okay for me to say that? Or, or am I somehow on God's naughty list for doing so? Folks, according to the Pew Research Center, four in ten Americans believe we're living in the last days. Now, I could continue to list a number of facts that clearly set us apart from the disciples 
in the matter of knowledge and discernment and understanding, you know, as, as we see them at the beginning of Acts. I uh, haven't even mentioned the April 8 eclipse coming up, in which that marks the seven year, that concludes this seven year, you know, between the two eclipses, 2017 and 2024. That's coming up April 8th. And just look at how we're divided as a country here in the United States. That's all I got time for. I love you all. I truly do. Rest in Him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.